We now have our final hearing before the general public with the Board of Elections. We will now hear from Michael J. Ryan, Executive Director of the Board of Elections, and Don Sando, Deputy Executive Director of the Board of Elections. The Board is responsible for conducting all elections in the City of New York. Its fiscal year 2015 budget uh, totals $113.9 million, including $56 million in personal services funding to support 346 full-time positions and over 36,000 poll workers. The Board's fiscal 2016 proposed budget of $84.4 million is likely to be modified to meet the Board's changing needs. Because of the nature of elections, the BOE's budget varies significantly from year to year based on several variables, including the type of election, local, statewide, congressional, or presidential, implementation of new voter laws, special elections, and other changes in election scheduling, many of which occur mid-year. Today's hearing will examine the Board's budgetary needs for the upcoming fiscal year and discuss reforms that could improve the Board's operations and potentially lead us to cost savings. We will find out how the Board is preparing for upcoming elections and what it is doing to improve election day operations. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing your testimony, as is the practice, uh, if uh, you or uh, for, for the Executive Director as well as Deputy Executive Director and anyone else you anticipate will need to assist in answering questions, I will ask to please affirm the truth before that affirm that you will tell the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions. I do. I do. Thank you. Uh, if you could please begin with your testimony. Chair Kalos and members of the New York City Council on Governmental Operations Committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you on behalf of the Board of I am Michael Ryan, and joining me here at the table is the Board's Deputy Executive Director, Dawn Sandow. There is additional staff uh, present as well, and they are stated in our written testimony. Before we commence discussing the Mayor's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2016, I would like to again thank the City Council and the Mayor uh, for providing the necessary funding to the Board in fiscal year 2015 uh, to meet its constitutional and statutory mandates as well as the needs of the voters in the City of New York. I would like to take a few moments to highlight some of the accomplishments of the Board in fiscal year 2015 that this funding made possible. The Board has taken positive steps to improve the voters' experience at the poll sites. These steps include expediting the processing of voters. One of the ways that that was accomplished was through the elimination of voter cards. Uh, by eliminating the voter cards, uh, we sped up the process by which uh, voters could ap approach uh, the, the book and move on to the scanner. In addition, we have improved the poll books themselves by including alpha tabs on the, on the pages. And one item that I know is near and dear to the chair's heart uh, of this committee is the including of the voters' age in addition to the uh, in, in addition to the date of birth in the poll book. Uh, We're getting to know each other too well. <laughs> uh, another major accomplishment for the board this year was a close attention to the improvement of the ballot design. Now, there are still other things that we'd like to do moving forward as, as well as working with the state legislature, but within the current framework, we are limiting the ballots to a maximum of three languages. And that allows us to have more real estate available by, by not having a five-language ballot in the 79 election districts in Queens. Uh, we can have a uniform font size throughout the city. We cannot guarantee a particular font size for every election because the complexity of the ballot uh, controls that. Uh, but in any event, this was a significant step forward uh, to allow uh, a more readable ballot. In addition, we have responded to uh, requests not only from this body but other uh, governmental uh, bodies as well with respect to enhancing voter privacy. One of the things that we did uh, to improve that was we purchased larger privacy screens that are placed uh, on either side of the scanner machines and that they're three inches wider and, and three inches higher and five inches wider. So that gives the voter a more private experience when they're approaching the scanner machines. We've also improved the privacy sleeves for the ballots. Before, we essentially had uh, an off-the-shelf staples folder that often the ballot was extending beyond that and was 
could be readable by somebody waiting in line. We now have a privacy sleeve that is long enough to encompass any length of ballot that we would typically use and also has the voter instructions on it, which will speed the process because folks can read the instructions while they're online waiting to approach the scan. We also have allocated additional training time for poll workers to emphasize the importance of maintaining voter privacy. An added effect that we've uh, determined through the elimination of voter cards is that by eliminating the voter cards, the poll workers don't have a need to be as close uh, to the voter. So that has had an added benefit of, of making the process more private for the voters. Some additional highlights are the board has reviewed our document uh, retention standards for all categories of documents that are re required to be kept and maintained. This comprehensive review has resulted in the board's ability to dispose of documents that were pre previously kept beyond the statutory retention requirement timeframes. Uh, and I might add that the voter documents are required to be maintained electronically. So we have to keep the originally signed documents for a period of two years, and then after that, we only have to maintain the electronic version. Uh, to date, the board has recycled 136 tons of paper by eliminating the voter registration documents in accordance with the New York State uh, document retention schedule. This disposition of documents has allowed the board to recapture over 10,000 square feet of usable space in our facilities throughout the five boroughs, and we've been able to repurpose that space for other vital functions. In November 2014 general election, the board successfully conducted a pilot uh, to transmit unofficial election night results directly from over 200 poll sites using handheld electronic tablets. This effort represents a significant first step in speeding the process for the posting of the unofficial election results to the board's website for public viewing and providing results uh, to the New York State Board of Elections and the media. And the graph that you're seeing up there, the black line on that graph, which will show you uh, commencing at 9 p.m. and then you see 9.30, uh, 9.20, 9.30, that black line is the pilot program. So that is a graphic representation of how much we were able to speed the posting of the results in the 216 poll sites that we, uh, that, that we utilized the, the, uh, the tablets. That is a harbinger in a positive way of things to come. When we're able to do this throughout the five boroughs of the city of New York, we can expect similar results. The reason that we can say that with, with confidence is due to the ingenious design of the software that was developed in-house. The software doesn't have to wait. So if you happen to lose connectivity on a particular device, you can still upload the results. And then once the connectivity is reestablished, then the results will upload sequentially based on the, uh, on the order in which they were entered into the system. We're excited about this and we're working very, very closely with the administration uh, to secure all of the, the funding necessary to be able to expand this uh, to a citywide endeavor. So that's something that we're very happy about and uh, I think the public will be too. Um, to meet the poll worker staffing needs, the board proactively utilized an automated calling service to recruit potential poll workers by contacting registered voters in areas where we anticipated vacancies. The board successfully recruited over 1,500 poll workers utilizing this process in a, in a, in a limited way, and we're looking to expand that uh, moving forward. And it's also a relatively low cost way uh, to reach out to people who were previously untapped resources. In May 2014, the commissioners voted to modernize the timekeeping system by ordering the implementation of city time agency-wide. The board worked closely with the Office of Payroll Administration, uh, the Financial Information Services Agency, and do it to establish an implementation schedule and develop training. The first offices went live in August of 2014, 
and successive locations were added pursuant to the previously agreed upon schedule. Ultimately, by the first week of February 2015, all agency offices were online and utilizing city time. <coughs> to improve leadership and efficiency, all board managerial and supervisory staff attended an intensive three-day program given by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. This training was tailored for the specific needs of the agency to improve employee evaluations, productivity, promote effective communication, and the delegation of responsibility, responsibilities. The board plans to continue working closely with DCAS to develop an ongoing process and curriculum to further our goal of ever improving managerial ability. To assist the board in maintaining the accuracy of the voter registration list, the board subscribed to the Social Security Death Master File Index in 2014. The board worked closely with the New York State Board of Elections and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to ensure timely transmission of city death records directly to the statewide voter registration list. For the 2014 general election, the board utilized a feature of its electronic voting system which identifies those ballot images that contain potential write-in votes. This reduced the number of ballots required to be manually reviewed by staff by 98%. The board initiated a sealed competitive bid process for the procurement of ballots used on election day. As a result of this process, the board anticipates realizing a substantial reduction in ballot printing costs as well as providing built-in vendor emergency backup. So we'll have some redundancy in the system so that if in the event that an individual vendor has a, uh, a point of failure, there'll be a, bu a built-in backup to that system and we're excited about that as well. In our continued efforts to utilize the latest technological developments in, in the election industry, the board has purchased high-speed printers to enable the printing of absentee special military, presidential, and federal ballots in each borough as they are needed. These ballot on demand printers will increase the ballot management efficiency and result in further ballot savings. And in addition to that, uh, we also have high speed scanners that are compatible uh, with these ballots that we can use for other purposes that aid in the overall processing of paper ballots, which would include uh, emergencies and affidavit ballots in the post-election counting process. So that is uh, a significant improving, uh, improvement moving forward and it's the first time that the city will have a unified voting process uh, for both absentee ballots and election day ballots. Prior to that we had machines from two different vendors. In FY 2016 the board foresees conducting as many as four Citywide election events, including a state and local primary in 2015, a general election in 2015, presidential primary and or primaries in 2016, and the federal offices primary in 2016. Offices include, included in these election events are district attorney, civil and Supreme Court justices, presidential candidates, delegates to the national conventions, as well as members of Congress, and numerous party positions. As always, as we are about to experience in uh, the next six weeks, uh, the potential for special elections always remain a possibility. The board uh, contracted with the nationally recognized election center to analyze the current poll worker training system and recommend improvements based on the best practices and su successful techniques from across the country. The board intends to implement recommendations made prior to the 2016 presidential election. The board has worked closely with Election Center to compress the original contract time frame from three years to two years in order to accomplish, accomplish these goals and meet the deadline, the self-imposed deadline that we have to be ready for the presidential elections in 2016. In accordance with Orders entered in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, the board anticipates significant additional expenditures in fiscal year 2016 related to improving poll site accessibility. This includes contracting with the court-appointed third-party surveyor to conduct surveys for all, which encompass over 1,200 poll sites citywide. These surveys 
conducted in accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act will identify barriers to the free and independent exercise of the franchise, both inside the poll sites and on the exterior approaching the poll sites. And basically, our mandate is to assess these sites from a curb cut access point all the way up to the front door of the poll sites and as well as on the interior up until the point where the polling room exists. Uh, and we also then have to uh, go along with the recommendation, the recommended remediation for any of these barriers to the independent uh, franchise. I, for our fiscal year 2016 budget projections, the board has analyzed recent budgets and identified two fiscal year budgets with similar challenges facing the board in FY16. And what you see here is our effort to present a fair and accurate statement of needs since every one of our years, unlike some other agencies that, that, that have uh, repetitive budgets uh, throughout the, that are consistent from year to year, the Board of Elections ebbs and flows, depending on the number of events we have. So what we did here was we took fiscal year 2012, which we thought was similar, and fiscal year 2014, and created uh, a, mod uh, a modified average of the two, and that's how we're trying to make our project projections for 2016. Uh, in addition, the projections in our, our projections are predicated on the restoration process in the executive budget consistent with the average of those two fiscal year budgets. Therefore, the board has limited its request to those new needs which will be required to conduct elections throughout fiscal year uh, 2016. The board projects an, a budget of $144.8 million, which represents a $12.3 million increase over the current modified average of fiscal year 2012 and fiscal year 2014, which amounted to 132.5 million. The breakdown of that is as follows. For personal, ser personal services uh, in the form of poll workers, as the court mandated site survey process moves forward, the board anticipates that additional poll workers will be required to ensure all poll sites are barrier free on election day. One of the ways that that's, one of the requirements that we have is that we will need accessibility clerks in certain locations if the effort required to open a door exceeds a certain uh, amount uh, and somebody that was utilizing a, a wheelchair safe for it, for instance, was unable to use the door by themselves. We would need to post somebody at the door in order to uh, have them access uh, the, the poll site. Uh, the board anticipates providing additional specific accessibility poll to uh, training to all poll workers as well. Based on the anticipated four citywide election events, the board requires an additional 4.8 million over the 31.8 million currently mod of the current modified average for additional poll workers costs to meet these federal court mandates. In addition, we have our other than personal services, uh, OTPS uh, requirements. The board's analysis shows that an additional $7.5 million is required to uh, supplement the OTPS allocation over the $66.8 million current modified average. With this additional funding, the board's OTPS budget will provide for extended warranties on the electronic voting systems as the initial statutory warranties that uh, were in place since 2010 are, have expired or are about to expire. Costs associated with the contracts for the court mandated third party surveyor and the professional installation of any accessibility equipment for the election events. Now, I, I would like to clarify that to, to, to some extent if, if I can. We might need less poll workers if some of these physical remediations to the, to the sites are made. So some of this is fluid. What we are intending to do here is to create, uh, to, to provide the council with a worst case scenario 
uh, so that we don't get caught in a circumstance where we don't have the funds available if they're necessary. The other thing that I, I must tell this, uh, this body is that we are working closely with the administration, uh, most notably the Mayor's Office of Operations. We've had some preliminary conversations, and we are going to put together a working group uh, that will consist of, at a minimum, the Department of Education, uh, NYCHA, the Parks Department, and other stakeholders, so that we will all be on the same page and share information with respect to other ADA compliance remediations that may be happening at the various facilities, which may also then negate uh, the necessity of the Board of Elections having to uh, do those remediations. Um, in order to enhance the board's ability to recruit, uh, and in conclusion, in order to enhance the uh, board's ability to recruit and retain qualified poll workers, the board is renewing its request for the council and the mayor's office to consider raising the uh, poll workers' compensation by $100 per election event. That would result in an overall increase of $3 million approximately for every citywide election event. We did not include that in our projections uh, because we recognize uh, you, the, the uh, financial circumstances uh, and, and we also know that that's something that uh, has been considered in the past, uh, but certainly if, if that could happen, it would represent a, a good thing and a positive step forward uh, in terms of our ability to recruit poll workers. Uh, the, the board remains sensitive to the fiscal challenges faced by the city and is mindful of its obligations to serve the voters of the city of New York. The board remains, considered, remains committed to the partnership that has been forged with this administration and this council. And I would like to personally uh, thank Chair Kalos, uh, as well as the administration, for what I believe has been consistently fair dealing with respects to the financial uh, needs of the boards of Board of Elections. And I know that you all have a Herculean task to try to balance the needs of, of everybody. And so I, I'm mindful of that when we sit across from you asking for money. Uh, the board is confident that the additional funding requests will enhance its ability to serve the voters of the city of New York the board reaffirms its commitment to this council that any allocated resources will be widely, wisely utilized and the public trust will continue to be the guidepost. As, as always, uh, myself and Ms. Sandow are available for any questions uh, should, uh, should the council have any. Thank you for your uh, testimony and for your uh, PowerPoint. I want to just start off with a, a Thank you. Uh, what, a, what a difference a year makes. Uh, <laughs> just going through, through our old punch list, uh, you've ended the use of, uh, we, we asked and you ended the use of voter cards. Uh, the DOI made hay over people who are voting with the wrong ages and we now have the voter ages in the poll book instead of requiring people to try to do math on the spot. Uh, the font size is being changed for readability. Um, you're actually focusing on voter privacy, which has been something that we've uh, focused on for a, quite a while. You recycled 136 tons of paper uh, and cleared out 10,000 square feet, which is incredible, and we'll be able to have uh, cost savings as a result. Uh, we asked you to implement city time, and you've done it. Um, you are also going above and beyond by having training and taking advantage of DCAS training services. We asked you to use the Social Security Death Master File Index. You're doing that. Um, we asked you to use the write-in system, the, the write-in detection system to save on counts. You, you've done it. Uh, I think one of the personal favorites here has been about trying to reduce costs for ballot printing. And you are brought it in-house, and you're printing it on high-speed printers. And uh, you've done it. So um, I, I think uh, people with it, I think that a lot of people prefer to see the, the, the dis it, it's more fun to beat up on the, the more dysfunctional Board of Elections, but under your leadership um, and uh, through this administration, we've been able to really get more done than I think your agency gets credit for and that you get credit for and that you and your team get credit for. So I just want to start off with just a, a hearty thank you because uh, 
I don't think anyone expected us to start with that punch list last year and see any change. I think many people expected us to just go through that punch list for the next four years, and sadly there's no more punch list because so much of it has gotten um, done. Uh, with regard to the uh, PMMR, um, for those who have been watching all day, I've been pretty focused on it. Um, as a manager and somebody who's run companies, I find that you, you get what you measure and uh, you set goals so that you can attain them or not, but that's how you measure success and failure. Uh, to, to that end, um, it seems that there, there are very limited, that, that you have two, two items that you measure. You have uh, the voter registrations, voter complaints, interpreters, and then you also have the agency resources, but you don't really have indicators. Uh, would you be friendly to adding to the mayor's management report uh, key indicators that you might select on your own uh, to evaluate your own performance and the performance of your staff, um, particularly things like wait times uh, and where that wait time is. Is it the wait time at the initial check-in to be sent to your poll site or at, sorry, to your ED or is it at the ED table or is it at the ballot casting and just uh, wait times at various locations. Um, another piece uh, would probably be something like ballots printed, ballots cast, and ballots recycled because they weren't used. Um, and other key items, I would love to see a proposal from you of the types of pieces you're using internally to manage your own staff and manage productivity. Uh, similarly, as we focus over and over again on voter registration, how many voter registration cards are we getting, how many are we processing, and how many are being rejected and why and items like that. Just uh, t getting down to the nuts and bolts of the work that you do and uh, best ways to manage it. So can we count on your agency to come up with better performance metrics and set tough goals and achieve them? Certainly uh, those are good suggestions. Uh, we, we do have our annual report that comes out. We, we it, It's chock full of information, but certainly uh, we're I think the point that I was trying to drive home with respect to uh, the staff evaluations and, and working with DCAS is to let this committee know that we are looking at all of those things and every critical process. And so we, we took some of the bigger picture items and now I think as we drill down, these are uh, some good suggestions that we can, we can work towards. And perhaps we're developing a new punch list no, not really. <laughs> with, 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 this is the same question I've asked seven <laughs> other agencies, well, six other agencies today. Uh, similarly, in terms of targets, I think goals are important. So, for instance, uh, you don't actually have any goals for fiscal year 15 or 16. You just have asterisks. Uh, and so um, voter registration forms processed according to the PMMR are 642,460 in fiscal year 13, and then miraculously 642,460 in fiscal year 14, with no targets for fiscal year 15 or 16, and, and you, you have not reported actuals for fiscal year 14 or 15. So I'm just curious about providing measures there. With respect to voter registration forms, uh, I can tell you uh, that the, the way we deal with them is we process what comes in. So uh, we, we could come up with an annual average if we look back over you know, four-year election cycles. Again, they, they do have a tendency to ebb and flow. We, we find that voter registrations typically increase during presidential election years and they drop off in other years. Uh, that is certainly something that, that we can look at. Uh, but, but the bottom line is we are required to process what comes in and we do that and there are times uh, for example, it was before I was here in 2012, but there were some issues associated with, uh, with getting the, the, the crush of forms that came in processed, and an outside vendor had to be brought in in order to make sure that we met the deadline to get people registered on the voter rolls and, and in the book for election day. Um, another key piece while we have the uh, budget up um, we have a capital budget and an expense budget. With regard to the capital budget, when we say we're going to uh, approve $10 billion in bonding, we don't actually float the bond until we're actually ready to spend that $10 billion. 
So to the extent that we may uh, over budget there, um, there are less consequences because if we don't end up spending the $10 billion, it didn't come from anywhere other than a bond that didn't let get floated. With regard to the expense budget, that is more finite. We have 77.7 billion. Last year we had 73 billion when I got elected. But when we over budget as an agency, when, when you over budget as an agency, that means money that another agency doesn't have for things like education or social services. Uh, what you have there are what was you've been budgeted for, but according to our numbers in fiscal years 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, you've been consistently under budget. In 10, it was 95, uh, um, it was 95 million. million. In 2011, it was 102 million. 2012, 109 million. 2013, 107 million. And in 2014, 116 million. Um, so if you can share why you're consistently uh, so under budget and why you're always putting in a request for so much more and uh, what you expect your budget surplus to be in 2015. It depends on where we end up at the end of the year, but one of the big problems that we have in terms of making projections, we know how many poll workers we need to run poll sites, and, and a big chunk of our expense budget where we end up not not spending is because we train poll workers and then they don't show up. So we we have vacancies in our in our poll workers, uh, and and that ends up showing up as payroll. Now, in in years past, they the poll workers used to get processed at more or less as uh, independent contractors, and they got a 1099. And then there was an IRS uh, regulation that said, no, we have to process them as employees and do withholding. So now that's all showing up in our, uh, in our PS budget. And that's where our, it's soft and it's difficult to make a hard representation as to what the actual number is going to be. When it comes to the things that we can control, and if uh, if you guys take a look at what we're talking about here, we're not asking for any new money this year. We're not. The monies that we're asking for as new needs, I would rather say as new requirements. Because new needs kind of presupposes that you're asking for something. What, what we're asking for here are things related to uh, the federal court case, um, which both is poll worker cost, we're not asking for one head in new staff, uh, full-time staff that's working. This is poll worker cost. And also potential uh, capital remediations, or maybe not capital remediations, temporary ramps and such, expense remediations that have to be done at poll sites, as well as approximately 2.2 million of OTPS money to accommodate uh, upgrading or having a new warranty for the electronic voting system. So every bit of money that we're asking for here right now is uh, an items that are beyond the control of, of the Board of Elections. So do you anticipate a budget surplus for fiscal year 2015? I anticipate that there will be a budget surplus uh, for 2015 to some extent. I also anticipate that we will ferret that surplus out in the intervening weeks when uh, we sit down and have uh, further discussions uh, with the uh, Office of Management and Budget, and, and, and we compare notes, and they'll tell us uh, what their thoughts are on those subjects as well. And, and, and we will act in a fiscally responsible manner. And, and I think the fact that uh, we have returned money to the coffers of the city of New York is not demonstration of a failure to plan, but it's demonstration of fiscal responsibility, and that we weren't spending to the budget just for the sake of spending to the budget, that we give money back when we think we can. Thank you for not spending your full allotment, and I, I do appreciate that. I would just prefer to make sure we do, uh, I think it's a balance of fiscal prudence and, and fiscally responsible planning. Uh, and you, you touched on poll workers. Um, in, if you could just go over, 
the poll worker salaries have been going up over the years, and if you can share that schedule of what they were however many years ago. Um, I, I know we've been doing incentives for completing training and different items, and then we also noticed that in uh, 2013, you had 96% of the folks uh, show up, and uh, in uh, 2014, we had 88%. So if you can share what you believe accounted for that, and uh, other than r right. raising the salaries, what you think you can do to improve the people actually showing up for the job? What I would say is uh, the city of New York is already ahead of the state uh, law. Uh, state law mandates that poll workers get paid, uh, regular poll workers get paid $130. Uh, New York City pays poll workers $200 for the shift. Uh, and the poll site coordinators get paid by state law, $200, and New York City pays $300. So we're already ahead of, of what the state law requires, and we're not uh, uh, you know, belittling that in any way, shape, or form. However, the raise... And, and you give a bonus if they do the trainings and complete and there's a, And there's bonus you know, if, if they do the, the, the training as well. We're talking about the, the actual pay that they get on election day, right, except so, by statute. It comes out to about $800 for right. a general election. But they, but they have to work all three elections. Because yeah. if, if they work two, they don't get the bonus. So it, you know, it's a little bit of a, a, a math issue that we do, but we're, we're trying to encourage folks to, to, to stay with us. Once they come and work and they get some experience, we, we want them back. Uh, so we are ahead in New York City of where the state statute says we have to be. Um, but there hasn't been a raise in the city of New York since 2001. So it stands to reason that if something was deemed sufficient compensation in 2001, uh, if that compensation remains the same in 2015, that it may no longer be deemed to be sufficient compensation. Uh, it, it's difficult to tell what remember, the raise would be. Do you remember what year the bonus was added, or was that since 2001? Pardon? So it, it, it went up, there was a $100 bonus, but in, uh, and that was in 2000, between 2001 and 2010, but we've reduced it to $75 because we don't have uh, the funds to, to, to pay the $100 bonus anymore. Do, do, you, do, uh, do you happen to, re to, to remember when the bonus started? And I, I seem to also recall that the, the per shift used to be 150, or it was closer to the state minimum before I know that since I've been doing this stuff, it's changed. Well, <laughs> I, hold on. This has been a fluid and ongoing process from 2001 to 2010. Uh, Ms. Sandow, uh, I'm gonna take it as a reminder because it happened when I was a commissioner in 2010 uh, when we rolled out the new machines. Uh, I can tell you I don't independently recall that, but I'll take her at her word. She hasn't steered me I wrong yet. <laughs> but it, suffice to say, the, the Board of Commissioners in whatever uh, composition it is over the course of years does what it can within the allocation that we have to keep as many previously utilized poll workers as we can. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge and we are seeing a drop off. And as a matter of fact, there, uh, there's some information that we've included in the, in the materials that we submitted to you that we didn't put up on the screen, but we could to show you, there it is. 2013 comparison of county and non-county poll workers. So if you see the darker shade, that those graphs represent how many of our poll workers come from a county party source versus another source. Uh, so you're seeing those numbers. Uh, you know, we got uh, the federal primary in 2014 being an aberration, but we're seeing it drop down to like a one-third uh, two-thirds split in that range. Uh, 
which means that we then have to be more creative about where we go find our poll workers because they're not coming from the traditional sources. And that's one of the reasons why you saw we went ahead and did the, uh, the robocall to try to you know, invite some more people into the process. But, but you can see, um, it's, it, it's a changing dynamic. And uh, were the poll worker positions publicly posted? Pardon? Were the public, were the, uh, as has been requested multiple times, were the poll worker positions publicly posted? Yes, matter of fact, we have a, a website, electiondayworker.com, and anybody can go on to electiondayworker.com and, uh, and, and apply to be a poll worker. As a matter of fact, when we did the robocalls, uh, we gave folks the option of, you know, if they wanted to hear about registering online or if they wanted to call uh, or receive a call from us. Uh, and uh, we had some folks that, uh, that went right to electiondayworker.com, which is why the 1,500 uh, number of additional poll workers is not a hard number because we are not able to factor in those folks that went into electiondayworker.com. There wasn't a special queue for them to uh, apply through. So we're presuming that that 1500 number is actually higher, but there's no way for us to estimate it. Uh, we, we suggest asking on your application, a, where did you hear about us? Yes, we could do that, but uh, Councilman, you have to appreciate I, how I pre quickly I, we did it. I mean, uh, th I, this, it was a, uh, a commissioner, I'll, I'll give him credit, Commissioner Shimon, uh, suggested that we do the robocalls, and, and in the span of less than a week, we were up and, and doing the robocalls. So certainly that's a worthy suggestion to try to include in, a, in our next go-round, but uh, we kind of had our backs up against the wall a little bit, and we tried to do something outside the box. With regard to an increase in poll worker salary, I think it is prudent to, if you can please provide us with a complete history of the different changes in incentives that have happened between 2001 and 2015, including training, bonuses uh, for, for multiple elections, the, the average amount actually paid out to people and compared to, to others. Um, I think the last time you uh, came here, uh, it was indicated that uh, the, the poll workers here actually made more than in other places. So um, if you can please provide that. And uh, what other ways are you looking to bring in additional poll workers? We have uh, partnered uh, both with the uh, previous administration and the current administration as well. And, and both uh, uh, administrations have been very gracious in allowing us to put our information out on nyc.gov. Uh, so we're getting those banners in and around, typically in and around election time. I don't know if they're up all year, but certainly in and around election time uh, when we need uh, election day workers, uh, they, they, they do that. And uh, that's another avenue. Uh, now, I, I will say this, that uh, we had a big push on, when there was uh, Help, Help, Help America Vote Act funds available when we implemented the machines in 2010 uh, for, for outreach, and that included all forms of outreach. And under the current uh, circumstances, uh, it, it seems like outreach is the, is the first to go, uh, and, and an aspect of the process that seems to be deemed less core services than, uh, than some other things that we have to do. Uh, but certainly, oh, we're looking for as many outlets and venues that we can have, uh, including online opportunities and anyone uh, that has a suggestion about how we can reach more folks. Uh, the information is there anyway. The question is how do we drive people to our website to get them uh, to, uh, to, to avail themselves of, of the information that's there, including the electiondayworker.com opportunities. I, I, I will share that I, I had not opening in my office. We don't do patronage hires in my office, so we uh, advertise in uh, Craigslist, Idealist, uh, City Limits, and uh, also on uh, City and State, and got over 300 applications for one physician. Uh, and so we actually spent five hours doing interviews yesterday, uh, and it was, it was great. So along those lines, are you, are you posting? 
uh, all jobs at the Board of Elections currently online. All of our vacancies are, are posted online with respect to uh, the, the actual job postings. Uh, presently, the job postings, the, the, the specific job postings are limited to technical positions. We, we did advertise recently, we hired someone uh, and postings were done in the New York Times as well as on monster.com. And we have, uh, I have copies of, uh, of, those, of that posting uh, if uh, the committee's I would love interested. it for the record so yep. that anyone can see it as part of this hearings okay. record. Thank you for that. So uh, what positions aren't? I understand you recently made a new hire on the executive side. Was that position posted? Uh, no, that position was not. However, uh, the individual is here with us today. Ms. Consumanis is here, and she's been a valuable uh, addition to the team. I can tell you that uh, she was, uh, I think, she was just about unanimously chosen by the commissioners. I think there might have been an abstention. Uh, I, I don't remember. But uh, certainly, uh, Ms. Katsimanis came to us from uh, New York State Senate operations, and she's been a, a valuable member of the team since her addition. And was she uh, a patronage hire, or how was she selected? Uh, I, I don't know, since I don't do the hiring, uh, but uh, certainly I can tell you that she was uh, the choice of the collective uh, body of the commissioners by vote of six or more. This was a position that we've been requesting since 2011. Right. Um, it's been in our past testimony that we needed a manager of operations. And, and is there a reason why that was not publicly posted? Again, those are not advertised or why that wasn't a quote unquote vacancy. Well, I, I can tell you from from the minute that I walked in the door and when I was uh, and when I was a commissioner, I felt that the uh, the balance of the managerial structure at the Board of Elections was imbalanced and that there was need uh, in order to meet the constitutional and statutory mandates of bipartisanship. That, that that leadership structure was out of balance. And so it was necessary under those circumstances to add a Republican uh, because there were two Democratic managers, myself being one of them. Uh, and the commissioners ultimately have reserved unto themselves, and I believe uh, within the legal uh, and statutory framework, uh, the right to uh, hire within their discretion. And so beyond the fact that it is commissioner discretion, there really is not much more th that I can say uh, with respect to that. The technical positions, however, are such that you must have people with that level of expertise. So the commissioners have carved uh, those positions out of this bipartisan requirement because if you, you either have the technical expertise or you don't. Uh, under those circumstances. So those folks are posted at monster.com, New York Times, and, and, and we hire accordingly. And, and the technical positions, are those civil servants or are those also? Uh... We, we do not have civil servants in the sense of, you know, a city agency civil service process, but we do have union members and our, uh, the, the vast majority of our staff are members of uh, CWA Local 1183. So when they come in, they do have union protection, but not civil service protection. It's similar, but not the same. And are these full-time employees? Uh, I, if you were here all day, and a couple people have been here all day, I sound like a broken record. We pay our people a living wage. We offer them full-time positions. We do not put people in a position where they work for us as a city, and then they still get social services from right. us. The, uh, the technical- well, We should not. We, 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 the city does that, but right. we, we shouldn't. Right, the technical positions that we have in our agency, uh, and I don't have them all committed to memory, but they are among the highest paid members of our staff. Uh, and the gentleman uh, that was recently hired uh, was hired, I believe, at an annual salary of $84,000, which I think is well above uh, anybody's definition of uh, a poverty standard. Uh, how, how, so how many full-time employees do we have and how many part-time employees do we have? The Not counting poll workers. Despite what designations may be in the payroll system, we have, I believe, one 
if my memory serves me correctly, one truly part-time employee. Everyone else in the board is a full-time employee, including those folks that we bring in uh, seasonally. So we have extra workers that we bring in typically from July uh, through the end of December to help us uh, through the election events. We usually bring them in and then uh, let them go at the, uh, at the end of the year. But even when they're working for us, they're full-time employees. Uh, so uh, everybody is a full-time employee. Some get paid better than others, but they're all full-time. And so at this time, you're not looking to make more people uh, full-time year-round versus just some w where you have two classes? Of well, what we are looking to do, uh, and we explored this during the collective bargaining process, and uh, there was a particular formula that was suggested by OMB, uh, and because of the formula, it, it, it didn't happen during the collective bargaining process. But what we are looking to do is take our employees that we call temps. Those temps really function more like provisional employees in a traditional city agency. We, we would like to avail some of those temporary workers uh, and, and perhaps over the course of time, and that would be a commissioner level decision, perhaps all of those temporary workers and give them a permanent uh, classification. Uh, but that we thought was gonna perhaps be addressed during the collective bargaining process and uh, ultimately, it was not. I, I have lost count of the number of hearings we have had about eliminating provisionals in favor of uh, people who are, are full-fledged employees. What do we need to do in order to bring in these temps well, so that they can have the same rights as every other employee? If, if I could give, put a little context around it during the collective bargaining process, that discussion came up and the, the formula that uh, I think it was OLR, I don't want to say for certain, but I believe it was OLR, said, okay, if we're going to take some of your temporary employees and we're going to make them permanent employees, there's going to be some cost associated with that. One of the significant costs associated with that is the reimbursement for uh, a full penalty of medical benefits. So, for example, if you are a temporary worker at the Board of Elections presently, the Board of Elections reimburses the union $77.94 for every 28-day qualifying cycle per employee. That roughly constitutes $26,000 a month. Um, if you are a permanent employee, that, now, if temporary employees, excuse me, get from the union vision and uh, dental, but not full medical uh, in the sense of they don't get the prescription benefits. So they pay a reduced dues out of their check based on a pro rata share of their salary. But if somebody's a permanent worker, that jumps uh, to, I believe, since we don't, since the city of New York does that reimbursement and we don't, I don't have the number at the tip of my tongue, but it's about $136, $137 uh, for every 28-day cycle per employee. So what the city, uh, what, oh, I believe it was OLR was suggesting is, we say, okay, how many people do you wanna make permanent out of the temp pool? And calculate, A, the increase in the hourly wage, wage plus the increase in the reimbursement to the union for the, uh, for, the for the full penalty of medical, dental, and vision, and then come up with a number, and then do a multiplier and I believe it was 0.13 was the multiplier that they suggested, and then agree to extend the contract into the out years to offset the additional cost. And the union viewed that as a non-starter and signed the memorandum of agreement without further conversation. That wasn't something that uh, the uh, executive management uh, wanted to walk away from and we were prepared to go back to the commissioners and make uh, certain recommendations based on those conversations however uh, the union at that moment uh, was not necessarily interested in that now i'm not saying that that can't be revived and that we can't have those conversations again and matter of fact olr has indicated that they will entertain one or more or as many side letter agreements uh, as we want to engage in over the course of time provided that we have 
uh, management and union agreement uh, in, on those issues, and they will not be an impediment if we do have agreement. That would be great. Uh, just as we start to clean up on the, that punch list where there's just a couple of items that uh, do remain, I, I would just love to have a list of the items that are being posted, such as the technicals, the poll workers, and the ones that aren't quite being posted in terms of for vacancies. Um, and then the, the other two items would be uh, the uh, Department of Investigations has suggested that the Board of Elections adopt the DCAS uh, conflicts of interest policy. The Board of Elections did respond. The commissioners reaffirmed their existing conflicts of interest policy. And uh, I was just curious why the why the commissioners did so versus uh, adopting the one from Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Again, that was a, uh, a commissioner level decision. Uh, the DCAS uh, close relative policy uh, was circulated. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that there was a full uh, discussion amongst uh, the commissioners. And since there were several uh, new members uh, of the board, uh, the outcome of that discussion was to have a vote to reaffirm uh, the COIB uh, policy as the ongoing and consistent uh, position uh, of the board. Uh, I, I would argue uh, that uh, the two policies are uh, substantially similar, uh, although not exactly the same, uh, but the spirit is certainly, uh, is certainly uh, adhered to. And I, and I also think that, you know, my reading of the, uh, the DCAS close relative policy is that um, it doesn't foreclose the possibility of relatives uh, working in the same agency, uh, nor does the, the City Board of Elections policy. But we make sure that there are no folks within the chain of command uh, that would create the appearance of impropriety. And there were, you know, go, I hate to go, you, you bring me back to that, the December 2013 that I'm trying to move forward from. But, uh, you know, all kidding aside, uh, there were four instances, four instances that were cited in that report. And, and, and I, I would like to say that if, if, the, if it was as rampant and widespread as uh, you know, popular opinion has has kind of taken it. They would they would have uncovered more than four instances, and all four of those instances have been rectified uh, in one way or another. Uh, one resulted in a transfer. One resulted in a uh, in, in somebody leaving, uh, and. Uh, the other two were commissioner level uh, issues, which I prefer not to, to comment on, but certainly I can tell you that v we're violations not doing and fines for the record. <laughs> uh, so with regards to that, if you believe that the Board of Elections is substantially similar to you, DCAS, I would uh, request that uh, that analysis be provided, uh, not, not to make more work for your legal counsel, but to the extent that you can compare and contrast and show your, your, your legal standing for why they are substantially similar. I would be interested in seeing that. And I think the last item on the DOA checklist was the background checks and uh, what has happened with that. Yes, and, and, and again, this is a, another area where uh, as the Love Fest continues, I would thank you, uh, Chairman, for your leadership in, in this regard and bringing uh, the Board of Elections and, the, and, and, and DOI together, uh, which you orchestrated a meeting uh, organized a meeting where we all sat down. And subsequent to that meeting, uh, there was an exchange of writing back and forth between our office and DOI. And one of the issues that, that we had in terms of implementing background checks is what does it exactly mean for the Board of Elections considering that we're not your run-of-the-mill typical agency? And, and by that I mean the standard of, okay, over $80,000, that's a pretty one, pretty easy one to, to figure out. But then when you dr drill down a little bit and you get to the point of anybody that's dealing with sensitive computer systems or sensitive information, that basically encompasses almost all of our employees, including those employees 
that have access to voter registration information but are only going to be working with us from July uh, to December. So we, we wanted to try to work on that to get some further clarification. And on October 23rd, 2014, I received a communication uh, back from uh, Commissioner Peters at DOI and he indicated to uh, me that because we had not uh, done the job postings and because the commissioners reserved uh, unto their, uh, uh, unto their uh, discretion the right to do that and because of the fact that, so we didn't do the job postings and what else did he want us to do? Uh, and because we didn't adopt the DCAS uh, close relative policy, which he refers to as an anti-nepotism policy. Uh, basically, he said that um, when we do those two things, DOI will work with us to do the background checks and that DOI is not going to work with us uh, to develop a background check policy until we do the two things, those two things. W would you enter that letter into the record? I, I certainly will. Uh, thank you. Um, getting back to more budget-oriented conversations, and after all, this is a preliminary budget hearing despite the fact that uh, we have rarely discussed too much of the budget in these hearings. Um, with regard to the uh, ballot printing contract, when will that be signed? Soon. And by soon, I mean really soon. We're expecting uh, DCAS to make an award in the coming days. Uh, and being sensitive to the procurement process, I don't feel that I should make any more public commentary on that uh, until the award is in fact made, but it's, but it's coming, and it'll be in place uh, for uh, upcoming elections. Uh, so it, it, it's happening, and I, and I will say this, uh, that's another area where we explored uh, the City Council's suggestion that uh, the DCAS, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, actually do the printing. Uh, DCAS respectfully demurred on uh, doing printing for us. However, we are following the DCAS process in terms of this procurement, and DCAS has been integrally involved every step of the way. And a matter of fact, they're managing the procurement process for us, and we're going to ultimately have a contract that fully meets the standards set forth by DCAS, which I think will make uh, many people very happy. Thank you for following through and responding to yet another one of the things that we've been talking to you about for more than a year. Do you anticipate cost savings based on this? There will certainly be uh, cost savings associated with that, um, and the cost savings will be more easily calculated once the final award is made public and the actual math can be done. We have in-house estimates, but until the final award is done and the specific vendors are publicly chosen, uh, I do not think it would be appropriate to share those in-house estimates, but the, this council can rest assured that we did the math. I'd like to recognize that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Richie Torres of the Bronx, and we've actually had perfect attendance by our members at this preliminary budget hearing over the past eight hours. Um, I will uh, ask the final concluding question, unless uh, somebody else wants to ask a quick question, but uh, online technology, you know I was gonna ask. Uh, online voter registration, uh, can you update the committee on when you plan to have fillable PDFs for voter registration on your website, where when the PDF is filled, you actually capture that information, so that instead of having to invest so much money into having workers who enter the cards, it's just a matter of the card coming in, matching it up, scanning the signature, and moving on. And then additionally, whether or not you'll be using technology that's been around for almost a decade through Rock the Vote, where when somebody fills out the form online, if you don't get the voter registration form in, you're able to follow up with them to remind them that you're waiting for their signature. The first uh, piece of your question is much more easily answered. We are in the process of doing the final testing to roll out uh, AVID 5, which is our voter registration uh, system. Uh, the program's been written. 
it's being tested, and one of the elements of the AVID 5 system will involve the utilization of a fillable PDF that will be available on our website. So that's happening, and, and I, I would say uh, 30 days out is not an unrealistic uh, time frame for that. We're, we're, we're closing the window on it. Uh, uh, and now, uh, I've just, hot off the presses, got a, a note passed to me from a staff member and said it is in fact completed and we are in the process of adding the new parties uh, that have been uh, recently uh, added by the State Board of Elections. So we're just making some final tweaks and, and we're, we're right there. Um, with respect to the second part of your question, if you could re refresh my recollection what, you, what that question was. Before we get there. If it looks like we're actually there, we would love to codify it. So we have an online voter registration bill that we would love to have the uh, board's uh, support on in codifying what you've already been able to accomplish. And, and, and by the way, th that, that would be uh, wonderful. We're working closely with the administration as well uh, to make sure that all of this occurs uh, in conjunction with the uh, agreement that was reached between the council and the mayor's office with respect to all the local, uh, I'll call them local uh, law 29 agencies. Uh, you, you guys may have a different label for them, but that's how we refer to them in-house. So that's all, all happening, uh, you, you know, dynamically as we speak. So um, the second piece of the question relates to existing technology from Rock the Vote or Turbo Vote or any number of m many different vendors. Uh, um, where when you fill out a form online, the system is set, it's a line of code, your staff is very capable and can also add it, that just takes their email address and hits them up and says, hey, it's been a week, we haven't gotten your form, did you mail it? If you did mail it, maybe you need to mail, print it out and mail it again. Um, here's a link to re-download your form, uh, we're waiting. And can hit them with another email saying, hey, we got it, welcome to the system. I, I can tell you, that we met recently with uh, Susan Lerner, as well as uh, Seth Flaxman from, uh, from TurboVote, and we are active, actively exploring ways to partner uh, with, uh, with Common Cause and TurboVote to see what we can do realistically to improve the, uh, the voting process and the voting experience for voters in the city of New York. Uh, any uh, type of partnership ultimately, if one uh, were to result, would be required to be approved by a vote of, of the full board of commissioners. There was nothing that occurred in those conversations that uh, indicated to me that there would be anything particularly controversial in trying to help uh, voters, uh, you know, track their absentee ballots, uh, as has been suggested by some, uh, and other things. Uh, along those lines. And so, uh, you know, as I do report back to uh, a board uh, and require their approval, uh, we, I can feel comfortable saying that we've had some preliminary conversations uh, and that there is some time frame on, uh, on the conversation that we had with a deadline of uh, about a month away uh, in order for us to take some action, and if that action is taken within that uh, deadline and that time frame, then certainly we may very well have something exciting to uh, to report back to not only to the city council but to the voters of the city of New York as well. The, the only thing that I would say to you as an agency, as I've said to countless others, is uh, please insist on making sure any software code that you're working with is licensed free and libre and open source software so that you can see the code, you can change the code, and you are not locked into any particular vendor. And then uh, Seth Flaxman did testify before this committee with regard to the absentee ballot tracking. That being said, I, I would make sure that you open the process to as many vendors as possible. TurboVote is not the only vendor that can do it or does it, and I would just want to make sure that uh, we, we are leaving things as open as possible and that no one individual or group of people is getting a preference over others and that you just get the best product that is the least expensive for the 8.4 million people who live well, here. Well, I, I will say this. First of all, uh, we, I had a little more time and so certainly no, no disrespect to the chairman's ability to ex explain open source, uh, but Seth explained it to me in, in more detail and, and I, I think I get it now. Uh, but uh, not that I was resistant to it, but it was having a little time uh, uh, you know, 
absorbing. Uh, but one of the things that we discussed, and again, uh, I'm a little reticent to, to say in, in detail, is the possibility of grant money and perhaps some significant grant money that would be available to advance uh, some of this process. So, so if we can make this partnership happen and the commissioners end up uh, approving it, this is a situation where it would be the proverbial, although I hate the phrase, win-win, uh, we'd be able to accomplish something at no cost uh, to the taxpayers. There are now at least two projects that I'm working on that are being funded by the Knight Foundation to the tune of over a million dollars, I think, at this point. So um, far be it for me to stop them from funding the things I work on. So uh, that being said, I'm happy to provide a letter uh, in support of any grants that you apply for. And in fact, we had Department of Record and Records and Information Services where we were talking to them about the grants. To the extent you can receive federal, state, or private uh, foundation grants for the work you do, that is amazing. I want to thank you for uh, joining us uh, for uh, the conclusion of our uh, Committee on Governmental Operations. If you are a member of the public who wishes to testify, uh, we currently only have uh, one member of the public from District uh, 33 who wishes to testify. Uh, so um, if you want to fill out the card, we'll, we'll bring you up first. I want to thank the Board of Elections for meeting with me on a regular basis, ongoing conversations, and all the amazing work that we do together. And for those of you watching at home, we've made significant progress. And for those of you watching from downstairs in City Hall, I hope that the media will actually cover it. Uh, positive news regarding what the Board of Elections has been up to and all the great work we've been able to do as a Board of Elections, as a council, as an administration together. Thank you. And, and if I could just end, I know that my, my name is, is the name that's associated with a lot of these things, but we really do have uh, an amazing team. I have an amazing partner uh, in, in Dawn Sandow, uh, and, and the commissioners truly are committed to making uh, this process better. So I want to publicly thank my staff for consistently making me look good and allow me to sit here and get accolades uh, from the City Council for great work that, I I in, in truth, is being done on their back, not necessarily mine. But thank you. Thank you.